I see progress. Five years after the Day of Tears, a new sound rises out of Haiti. That will bring hope to Haiti. It's already begun. And then, legendary head coach Bobby Bowden. People say, do you miss it? I said, not yet. Hear how he guided his team through the game. The team that can survive is the one that's going to win it. And through life. Man, you're going to be the closest thing these boys ever had to a father. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. U.S. airstrikes in Syria prevented an imminent terrorist attack against U.S. planes. That's the word from the military and the Obama administration. And it's just the beginning of a long campaign against the Islamic State. Today, new airstrikes came as President Obama worked to rally support at the United Nations. Chris Mitchell has the latest. One day after launching airstrikes in Syria, President Obama met with representatives of the five Arab nation coalition that supported the attacks. Well, uh, it is a wonderful opportunity for me to uh, welcome uh, these leaders, friends, partners uh, from uh, the region and to say thank you to all of them for uh, their participation uh, and commitment to rolling back uh, the violent extremism. The Pentagon briefed Israeli officials before the attacks and said their initial assessments indicated the strikes were successful. The targets included the Islamic State and a less well-known group of Al-Qaeda veterans called Khorasan near the Syrian city of Aleppo. The Pentagon said the group was planning attacks against U.S. airplanes. We've been watching this group closely for some time. You know, we believe the Khorasan group is, was nearing the execution phase of an attack either in Europe or the homeland. Uh, we know that the Corazon Group has attempted to recruit Westerners to serve as operatives or to infiltrate back into their homelands. Some Republicans supported the attacks, but do have concerns about the coalition. These allies really play both sides because there have been a lot of reports about Qatar, especially financing ISIL. And Qatar is the home of Al Jazeera that's always broadcasting very uh, anti-American and uh, uh, interviews, and, and that's their focus. So at least they're protecting both sides. I'm not in favor of that. They should be solidly with us but hats off to them for participating. Ross Leitonen added that the fight against terrorism is the new normal. In the meantime, an estimated 140,000 Kurdish refugees have fled into Turkey after another onslaught by the Islamic State. The war is going now. IS is attacking Kurdish villages. We were in a village and we went to the next village, they attacked it. We went to another village and they attacked it too. Then we went to the city. The people in the city fled too. They said they are heading to Kobani. After that, we came to the border and passed over here. These refugees are some of the latest victims of the Islamic State. Now that an air campaign has begun, many in the region hope it will help roll back the scourge of this barbaric group. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, the arm of the Islamic State reaches all the way to Australia. A man believed to be an ISIS supporter has just been shot and killed by Australian police. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat, Australian police shot the suspected terrorist after he stabbed two police officers in Melbourne. Police say the man recently had his passport revoked over national security concerns, and he displayed what appeared to be an Islamic State flag. The 18-year-old carried out his knife attack after he was asked to answer questions in a police investigation. Some experts suspect the attack was prompted by ISIS calling on supporters in other countries to wage war wherever they are. Radical Muslim preacher Abu Qatada has been cleared on terrorism charges, applauding attacks against Americans and Israelis. A military court in Jordan acquitted him based on the lack of convincing charges. Qatada was described as a one-time lieutenant of Osama bin Laden, and he's known for his fiery pro-Al-Qaeda speeches, though he's also spoken out against ISIS. Qatada additionally had been charged for involvement in plans to target Israeli and American tourists and Western diplomats in Jordan in 2000. In a separate case in June, Qatada was acquitted of a foiled 1999 plan to attack an American school in Amman. 
Climate change has been a big topic on the U.N. agenda this week. President Obama told the General Assembly Tuesday that the U.S. will do its part to combat global warming. Still, some are charging there's no evidence the Earth is facing a climate catastrophe. Dale Hurd has the story. President Obama was the headliner at a marathon session of world leaders who promised to spend billions of dollars to fight climate change. There's one issue that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent and growing threat of a changing climate. The president's words reflected the views of most Democrats who, according to one poll, view climate change as a bigger threat than the Islamic State. The president pledged to sign an executive order requiring the U.S. government consider climate change when investing in poor nations. And I'm announcing a new effort to deploy the unique scientific and technological capabilities of the United States from climate data to early warning systems. All of which will cost American taxpayers a lot of money. But missing from the president's speech is the growing view that climate change is not a threat. Because the Earth stopped warming 18 years ago, catastrophic weather events have been less frequent, and Antarctic ice continues to grow and not shrink. What it really shows is that climate and weather are much more variable than our computer models said they were, and it also shows that it's probably not going to warm up as much as it was forecast to. This week has seen protests around the world for politicians to act decisively to stop climate change. Thousands marched in New York, and it was a march that featured a deep hatred of capitalism and some very strange views. Essentially, we're um, embodying the energies of the ocean, and the ocean is very synonymous also with the energy of water that also resides in the body. Zen Buddhism concerns itself with beings, with all beings, not just human beings, but all beings. It's all about balance and, and, um, we're very, and spirituality is connected to the earth. We honor the earth and everything about it, all the elements and spirit. The polar bear is, it bears a disproportionate burden, so the polar bear is having a voice here as part of the march. It's a pagan religion. French philosopher Pascal Bruckner has written The Fanaticism of the Apocalypse. He likens the climate change crowd to a religious cult. Because it uses all the elements of traditional religion, especially the, the, the theme of the apocalypse. You have this culture of fear. You have, you have seen, now you have, you have to be punished. Climate protester Robert Kennedy Jr. says energy company CEOs should be thrown in jail. I think they should be in jail. I think they should be enjoying three hots and a cot at The Hague with all the other war criminals who are there. It's still not clear if world leaders will succeed in punishing the world economy with new regulations. China, the world's biggest polluter, wants an exemption to keep on emitting carbon. And several world leaders simply didn't show up for the summit. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The hundreds of thousands of people committed to fighting climate change left mounds of garbage in the wake of their weekend protest march through New York City. Critics are calling out the protesters on social media. Images posted on Twitter show piles of trash, including cardboard signs, plastic bottles, and garbage costumes left on the streets, piled on top of sidewalk mailboxes and posts. In an interview with the New York Post, David Kreutzer from the Heritage Foundation criticized the protesters for using fossil fuels by taking planes and buses to Sunday's event. President Obama made headlines when he arrived in New York for that climate summit, and it had nothing to do with climate change. It's because of what some are now calling the latte salute. When President Obama stepped off Marine One, he saluted two Marines as he held a coffee cup in the same hand. The video appeared on the White House's own Instagram account and drew ridicule from some users who saw the unorthodox salute as unpresidential. Now, while it is protocol for U.S. service members in uniform to salute the commander in chief, military experts Pat say it's not required for a civilian president to salute back. I think that's just one more thing. You know, uh, as an ex-Marine, I believe a smart salute is good, but holding he knew he's going to be saluted. He knew he's coming off the plane. You've got aides around there, and you say, hold my coffee cup, and he gets off and he does this. And then he gets back down, picks up his latte, and takes it on to the car. I think we need to give the, our president a break. He's got so much on his oh, mind Maloney, right now. Oh, there's, there's little <laughs> stuff like uh, a guy gets his head cut off, and he, he has a little ceremony, and a half hour later, he's yucking it up on the golf course with one of his buddies. I mean, yeah. there is some 
symbolism, and he is the main symbol. But that, that thing, I could see, you know, holding it in one hand and saluting with the other. But he yeah. saluted with the cup. Not he's not to, a military guy, though. I don't care what he is. He's president. He's the commander in chief of the armed forces of America. <laughs> I won't give him a break on this one. And I think all this airstrike is political. He's being forced to it, and he's going to get a lot of brownie points before the election. Wendy. <laughs> thank yes, you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Oh, very good. <laughs> You're enlisted. All right. Five years after an earthquake wiped out a quarter million lives in just 30 seconds, a nation emerges stronger than ever. Haiti now is um, much better off than it was then. I see progress. That will bring hope to Haiti. It's already begun. Hear how Haiti is rebuilding itself after one of the worst disasters in history. That's next. Tomorrow. My airspeed indicator was reading 110 and it had dropped to 40 in just the snap of a finger. An engine stalls. That's when I really knew we were in trouble. At 8,400 feet. I told the girls, I'm sorry, I don't think we're gonna make it. We begin our seven days ablaze on a wing and a prayer. God, I am not ready to go yet. And a crash in the canyons. The whole world went kind of black. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, it's been nearly five years since Haiti was devastated by a crushing 7.0 magnitude earthquake. A quarter of a million people were killed, and more than a million others were left homeless. The recovery has now been painfully slow, but as Ephraim Graham shows, survivors are now finding hope once again. These days, spontaneous singing spills out from the church to the streets of Haiti. The recovery from the earthquake has been slow, um, but it has happened. Five years ago, Haiti was literally a disaster zone. Um, there was rubble in the streets, um, and uh, most of the economy, business, and government was shut down. Matthew Moore arrived here in 2010, soon after the massive earthquake hit. It killed more than 200,000 people in about 30 seconds. This mass grave with thousands of unidentified remains is possibly the most painful reminder of the quake's horrors. The statistics here in Haiti are a series of lows, lowest life expectancy, lowest income, and lowest literacy rates in all of the Western Hemisphere. Despite the stats, there are growing signs of recovery, like paved, clean streets. Haiti now is um, much better off than it was then. There are still many, many problems. Uh, I see progress, it depends on who you talk to, on whether that progress is good progress or bad progress. Progress includes new construction projects, homegrown businesses, and the daily sound of children playing without fear. Once we raise up a, a generation of godly men and women, that will bring change to Haiti. That will bring hope to Haiti. It's already begun. While many disaster relief agencies have long packed up and left Port-au-Prince, a commitment to Haiti's future has kept organizations like CBN's Operation Blessing in town to run an orphanage. Regent University teams train Haitian pastors to be counselors. And Compassion International helps send children like Pierre Elise to school. These people are particularly vulnerable. And so after the earthquake, uh, they're not going to be the first ones helped. They're probably going to be the last ones helped. Alléluia, moi je ne Jésus que longtemps n'a moi cherché. It's taken years for Pierre to find his voice after the earthquake. I remember it happened around 4:40. School was over at 2:30. I met mom on the streets at 2:45. I never saw her again. Pierre's mother died in the disaster, leaving her three children behind. The next morning. We woke up and went looking for her. In that moment, we realized how big the impact of the earthquake was. We went out and saw people on the ground. It was weird seeing that many dead bodies. 
So I say to myself, oh God, maybe mom is dead too. A severe case of post-traumatic stress left the 17-year-old angry and bitter. But he refused to share his feelings with his father or anyone else. I didn't want to do anything except to wait for death to come and take me. So I became so scared, scared to go to school, scared to go to church, scared to go out. Pierre bottled his pain for more than two years until he attended a camp for young earthquake survivors and met with a child psychologist. I was facing the show under the shed of a coconut tree and she started talking to me. I started to weep and I wept for the rest of my time at the camp. I think that even when I was sleeping, I was weeping. Tears, prayer and scripture ended his nightmare and taught him that there is... Nobody greater than Jesus. God is able. He now dreams of bringing that message to other suffering children in his country as an evangelist and an engineer. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Porter Prince, Haiti. That's beautiful. I might add Operation Blessing is there and just some of the things they're uh, producing about a million pounds of tilapia every month. I believe I've got my right figures on that one. Uh, but lots and lots of eggs they're producing to have protein for the people. Uh, there is a chlorine plant. They're, they're producing chlorine so they can f get water, water filtrated. They have helped an, a, a hospital get going. And uh, that's just the beginning of so many other things. The Operation Blessing was there to stay, and they've done a tremendous job. So that's just one of the things that you support when you support CBN. Wendy. All righty. Well, coming up, the winningest coach in college football history, and he knows firsthand that it's lonely at the top. There's nothing there. You know what? The higher you go, the more lonesome it gets, and more you're by yourself. You know what? The legendary Bobby Bowden tells us what's more important than football after this. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. College football is out there, and there's some legends of the game. One of them was Coach Bobby Bowden. He hasn't coached a game in five years, but his presence still looms large at Florida State. And as sports reporter Tom Buring reports, Bobby was much more than just a coach to his players. He was also the father they never knew. Bobby Bowden was a college football fixture and legend, while other coaching colleagues came and went. His unequaled success is unlikely to be matched. He retired with the most career wins and bowl wins of any coach in Division I history. People say, do you miss it? I said, not yet. I got 57 years worth, but I love to watch it. I watch, I watch every game. I watch every Florida State ball game. It's a Florida State loyalty that comes after 34 years as the Seminoles head coach, where he brought 33 straight winning seasons, two national championships, and 12 conference titles, closing 14 straight seasons with a fourth national ranking or higher. Whether in a season, game, or quarter, Coach Bowden strengthened his team's stance to finish strong. As a coach, when that fourth quarter would come, what unique challenge, unlike any of the other quarters, does it pose? Well, I think the big thing about the fourth quarter, of course, you know how serious it is in a basketball game or in a football game, man. It, it all comes down to that, you know. And the team that can survive is the one that's going to win it. And uh, it, just like me, I'm in the... I'm in the latter part of my life. It's kind of like, boy, I got so much to say, and the gosh, I hadn't got a lot of time to say it in, you know? With a fourth quarter urgency, the man who once served as a surrogate father while coaching continues to mentor as a grandfather in his newest book, The Wisdom of Faith. Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord, that we honor him and put him first. I mean, I guess you'd call it respect. Coach Bowden accentuates the principles that equipped his players while helping him navigate his unprecedented achievements. What's most misleading about the journey in getting there? You get to the top and there's nothing there. You know what? The higher you go, the more lonesome it gets and more you're by yourself. You know what? And to me, that's why God has got to be the center of your life. There's nothing else. 
There is only one thing that's going to completely satisfy you, and that is your love for God who made you and who loves you and His Son, Jesus. And our young people are not getting it. How badly missed is the voice of a loving and available Father? I know my last years of coaching at Florida State, so many of my players had not, there was not a male figure in the home. They're raised by mothers. Thank God for mothers and the grandmothers. But well, where in the heck is the man? We've got to get the men staying back in the home. The, the breakdown of the American home is, to me, is the greatest thing we're lacking right now. Is it requiring more from head coaches and assistant coaches today to help offset that lack? Amen. What a great opportunity coaches have. I used to tell my coaches, men, you're going to be the closest thing these boys ever had to a father. So we must act it. We must accept that responsibility to show them what a father should be like. When I speak to a coaches convention, I speak every year somewhere. The first thing I tell them, don't make football your God. You're going to be a very unhappy man if you do. You put God ahead of football. Football is a priority, but not the priority. God is the priority. And we must always keep that in front of the coaches and the players. Bowden did when he coached and consistently, longing to reach a listening ear with a perspective he prioritized. I'll say it bluntly, know about Jesus. I wanted any boy who played for me, when God, when they sit before God in judgment, don't sit there and tell God you ain't ever heard of Jesus. Because old Bobby Bowden done told you about him down there on earth. You know what? I really, I really felt compelled to do that. It might not be politically correct, but I felt like when I coached a young man, I got to be sure he gets a degree. I got to be sure he's the best player he can possibly be. Then I got, I, I, I want him leaving me knowing about Jesus. He's tenacious with his message, especially after losing two grandsons in separate car accidents. The first came in 2004, a tragedy that also killed his son-in-law. Coach Bobby then wrote a letter asking his immediate family to take inventory of their spiritual lives. We're not used to losing people younger. We're used to losing family, mothers and daddies, grandmothers, granddaddies, but not, not children. Oh man, that it hurts, is it? There's no way you can explain that, you know, unless you've lost one yourself. Just plead with them again to find Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's a reminder to us that we're going to die too. I'm not anxious to go. But I am prepared if he took me right now. What do you think you'll hear from him when you see him? I think about, <laughs> again, at my age, you know, I'm thinking, you know, Bobby, one of these days you're going to close your eyes and they're not going to open again. And you're going to be looking right square at Jesus Christ. You know what? I kind of I kind of can't wait. He'll say, I always loved you. You know, that's him. And uh, I don't know, but I can't wait to hug his neck. Bobby Bowden college football's storied coach, whose on-field success brightens his legacy of coaching for life-changing rewards. I've never seen God, I've never seen the wind either. I've heard it, I've felt it, seen what it can do. And the same way about God, I've seen what He can do. And I've, I've heard Him and I've felt Him. When I see Jesus, I know exactly how God is. He has died for my sins. All I've got to do is accept Him. You know what? Boy, I jumped right on top of that one, baby. I got me a savior. You know what? To heck with everything else. That's what matters. 84 years old, wonderful man. What a testimony. What a beautiful guy. You can't help but love him. Every word he says glorifies Jesus. But he was a success. He's the winningest coach in college football history. But that's not what's important. What's important is one day I'm going to see the Lord. And you know, order your priorities right. We all have to. It is so easy to get caught up in the fact, hey, listen, I, I got to buy some stock. You know, they just sold an apartment in, in New York City. I think they, they sold it for $7,800 a square foot, $130 million for one apartment. So somebody's out in the hedge fund business making lots of money. And people are buying and selling and giving and, you know, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. We get so wrapped up in these things we do. But there's only one thing that's important. Only one thing. What Jesus said to Mary, there's only one thing important, and it won't be taken away from her. 
only one thing, and that's Jesus. What have you done with him? And I, I, Bobby's preaching to the choir. He's preaching to me, and he's preaching to all of us. And I really love that man and thank God for him. And what a testimony he's got. Bobby Bowden, ladies and gentlemen, he knows the right priority, and the priority is Jesus Christ. And when the end of your life comes, there's going to be one question. What did you do with Jesus, who was called the Christ? Nothing else matters. Not how much money you've got, not how pretty you were, not how popular you were, not how many books you wrote, not how many speeches you gave, not how many votes you got. None of that's going to matter. What have you done with Jesus? That's all that matters. Let's go to Wendy. What do you have? That was a great story. All right, thanks, Pat. Well, still ahead, a New Year's celebration like no other. Our good friend Paul Wilbur helps us ring in Rosh Hashanah later on today's 700 Club. Hi, I'm Terry Mewson. At CBN, we're here to pray for you all year long. But each fall, the entire staff of CBN sets aside a special week of prayer to pray for your needs. So please let us join you in prayer. No matter how big or small your requests, we want to pray for you. Please call us or mail your prayer request today. It's our privilege to pray for you. You are watching the 700 Club. We've got a lot of very important stuff coming up for you. All over the world, CBN medical teams are providing free medicine and surgery for people who can't afford it. As you're about to see, they've treated patients in some unusual places. In the aftermath of a typhoon that ripped through the Philippines late last year, Acer and Diana struggled to find medical help for their three-month-old daughter. She was struggling to breathe. So they rode five hours by motorcycle to find the CBN disaster medical team. We just took a chance. We weren't sure if they'd actually be there. A flat tire had delayed the team's arrival, so Acer and his family went looking for them. Soon, they found the team a few miles down the road changing a tire. There on the side of the road, CBN's Dr. Sheila examined baby Hannah and told the couple she had pneumonia. We quickly gave her an antibiotic, along with enough medicine to continue her treatment. That roadside care saved baby Hannah's life. It was good that we saw her. She could have died from this if she had not received treatment in time. In addition to the free medical care, we gave the couple some food and other supplies for the journey home. Thanks for saving our baby's life. Thanks for saving our baby's life. Thousands and thousands and thousands of times we hear something like that. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I'm glad you were there. You were an answer to prayer. Well, how, how do we get that way? Because God sends us and we're trying to be obedient to what his voice is and what his command is to uh, take care of the sick, to visit those that are in prison and in hospitals, uh, to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. We're doing that all over the world, either through CBN or Operation Blessing or Orphan's Promises, or one of the things that we do. And uh, you can participate. It's so simple. 
it's just 65 cents a day. You can be a 700 Club member. It's not a lot, but if all of us get together, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. That's what we can all do together. And so what we're asking you to do right now is to say, okay, you can count on me. Pick up the phone and call in and say yes. And by the way, this special month, uh, for those of you who tell your financial institution to just go ahead and send my pledge every month and just do it automatically, uh, it saves everybody some postage and some time and money. And we will send you something in exchange. Uh, this is called Psalms of Encouragement. Edie Wasserberg, who's in charge of all this stuff, came to me and said, I'd like you to read the Psalms. And I said, I can't read very well. And she said, well, no, yeah, you, you want to do it. You, you'll be blessed. Well, I was having trouble with my throat. I was having a hard time talking. I had to suck up a large quantity of honey to get through the... <laughs> but what came out apparently has touched a lot of lives. And we're getting some great response from people who have joined the Pledge Express and gotten these Psalms, selected readings from the Psalms. There's so much power in the spoken word when you hear it yeah. spoken over you. And Shirley from Woodbridge, Virginia wrote to say, thank you so much for the Psalms of Encouragement CD. I listen often. The Psalms heal the heart and refresh me. And Shirley, you are right on, so. Well, I'm thrilled. So it, it, it worked and I give credit to the Lord. As I've told uh, uh, on this program, I had a real good writer. If you have a writer as good as that as David, then you can't miss. <laughs> so, and yeah. I might add, you're in very good voice, sir. You seem to be in very good voice. Well, it, it was pretty, yeah. pretty raspy, but somehow the Lord took me through it. All right. <laughs> well, up next, our friend Paul Wilbur is here, and he's going to sing for us, so you don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. CBN presents Psalms of Encouragement to strengthen and encourage you. CBN is delighted to give you this faith-building audio CD by Pat Robertson, Psalms of Encouragement, as a free gift when you join Pledge Express. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Pledge Express is CBN's automatic way to give your monthly pledge. It saves you time and postage, and your gift arrives automatically, speeding your help to those who need it most. And because Pledge Express saves money, you'll receive special teachings from Pat and Gordon or the inspirational Miracle Living magazine each month. Join Pledge Express and get Pat Robertson's Psalms of Encouragement. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Call or go to CBN.com. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Shocking new estimates about the Ebola crisis in West Africa. U.S. health officials laid out the best and worst case scenarios ahead of the U.N. Assembly today. The Center for Disease Control says the number of infected people could explode to 1.4 million people by mid-January. But fast, aggressive action could keep that number far lower. About 5,800 people have been infected and nearly 3,000 have died since the first cases reported only six months ago. A federal judge sentenced conservative author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza to eight months community confinement and five years probation for federal campaign fraud. D'Souza pleaded guilty to making illegal campaign contributions to a U.S. Senate candidate in 2012. D'Souza made the film 2016 Obama's America, which predicted dire consequences if the president was reelected. After his sentencing, he posted on his Facebook page, a great calm comes over me when I remind myself that there is a higher power that is sovereign and remains in charge. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Tomorrow. My airspeed indicator was reading 110 and it had dropped to 40 in just the snap of a finger. An engine stalls. That's when I really knew we were in trouble. At 8,400 feet. I told the girls, I'm sorry, I don't think we're gonna make it. We begin our seven days ablaze on a wing and a prayer. God, I am not ready to go yet. And a crash in the canyons. The whole world went kind of black. Tomorrow on the 700 Club. 
Well, here at CBN, the autumn season means more than just cooler weather and the return of pumpkin spice lattes. It's a time when we celebrate the Jewish New Year. And there's no better way to mark the holiday than with singer Paul Wilbur. Paul, take it away. Hallelujah. Paul, welcome back to the 700 Club. Thank you, Wendy. Great it to be so with great you. It's so great to see you. And by the way, you look fantastic. What have you been Thank doing? You. How you been? Um, makeup right back here. <laughs> <laughs> I do great for me. <laughs> I know. What will we do without the makeup? You just sing Ad and I, one of your favorites, one of mm -hmm. our favorites from your new collection, uh, the Ultimate Collection. Mm -hmm. Paul, what, what does Ad and I mean? Ad and I is Hebrew. We have it translated in the Bible as Lord, but it means more than we understand in the, uh, the West. Our, our bass player is from the kingdom of uh, Great Britain. Oh. And, and so. We understand kingdoms. Lord means you own it all. Mm. So the Apostle Paul said, um, my life is not even my own. Um, and that's included in Lord. He owns the whole thing. And we are uh, his treasured possession as well. Now, about 20 years ago, Paul, the Lord spoke something to you. Very important. What did he say? Well, um, he said, carry this message to the nations in their own language, to the Jew first. And, uh, and that's what we've been doing now for all of these years. How many? Um, 37. 30? Oh, wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> I, imagine. I, I started when I was two. Yes, so right. So that would make me... <laughs> 39. Uh, yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> the audience like that. <laughs> uh, we just got back from Israel, and uh, we travel in the nations quite a bit. We record in Spanish, Portuguese, German, uh, English, of course, and... I just got a packet of Russian, uh, and we're working on a Hebrew, all Hebrew translation. Mm. We have some wonderful connections in the land to be able to just go and minister. We're in Cuba. We're I love some of your songs that are half in English, half in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just so, so rich. And by the way, I'm still listening to last year's album when you were here, Your Great Name. In fact, mm. I was listening to it this morning. You can ask anybody. Wonderful. That is, if you haven't gotten Paul's last album called Your Great Name, right? Your Great Name. You got to get that. It will just usher you in to heaven. I haven't found anything since that I like better, sure. except maybe this, because I haven't listened to this yet. Now, um, you're going to be, uh, first of all, you've always said that, you know, music is the universal language, and mm -hmm. you've seen that over your almost 40 years. Um, <laughs> 37, <laughs> don't, don't push okay, it. Okay, let's, no, let's <laughs> don't push it. Why, why do you feel that? that? Well, um, it, it's, a, um, it's an open door. Yeah. So we go to Cuba, we go to Jerusalem. The music is a... Uh, it, it attracts the, the, the ears and the hearts of people. And then the message, of course, is, is in the music. Mm. So um, music is kind of like a, an ambassador for the kingdom. It opens yeah. doors for us that just speaking, you know, if you come, you say, well, I'm a preacher. Oh, okay, right, well. Right. Um, but the music is, it is a universal language. It's a part of every culture in the world, and uh, and it's just a great door opener for us. Well, tonight you're going to be performing for the CBN community. Uh, what do you have in store for this event, for this Rosh Hashanah celebration tonight? Well, Rosh Hashanah, you know, uh, the feasts of the Lord. I like to quote the word. I know that it always they're always called the Jewish feasts, but Leviticus 23, the Lord says, these are my feasts. Mm. So it's an invitation to the body of Christ worldwide, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Tonight is supposed to be the, well, it is. It's the day for the sounding of trumpets. Right. And, uh, and then we go on to Yom Kippur, the most holy day, next Friday. And then the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe these are the feasts that Jesus will use as a sign of his second coming. He fulfilled the spring feast in his first appearing. The second time we hear in 1 Thessalonians, there'll be a shout from the, the angel of the Lord, a blast of the shofar, not Don Heist, <laughs> a, the one from heaven. Right. And then the Lord will appear, the graves will open. So I, I think we're awating his second appearing that may start on Rosh Hashanah. So. Yeah. 
prepare, get ready. Maybe it's tonight. Whew, get ready. It could be tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, if you live in the Hampton Roads area, you can join us at our Rosh Hashanah celebration. It begins tonight at 7 Eastern time. If you're not in the area, you can still take part. Just log on to CBN.com because we'll be streaming it live tonight. You don't want to miss it. Paul, uh, his new album is called The Ultimate Con Collection. It has all the favorites on here. Paul, it's always so great to see you. And Thank God bless you. you. We can't wait for tonight. Me too. It'll be a wonderful time. <laughs> well, still ahead, we'll bring it on with your email questions. Teresa says, how do I stay faithful when the devil works so well in my family? Why doesn't God just push the devil away? Pat will answer that and much more next. Hey, I'm Ryan, and I make people sound great. Quiet. Okay. It looked like what people hit. A lot of times I add sound effects to video to make it really come alive. You need a dog bark? I got it. You need some horn beeps? I got it. I add music to stories to set the mood. How was that? For drama. In television, audio is very important, especially when you're spreading the message of Jesus Christ. And I want to make sure people hear that message clearly. I'm an audio engineer, and I work at CBN. I'm going back to school for my second degree, a Master's of Business Administration. Regent is definitely helping me on my path by giving me all of the tools and resources that I need to be successful in my career. The colleagues that I go to school here with and the professors all believe and share the same values that I do. The goal for me going to school is to set a strong foundation, not only within my career, but also in my family, and I set a good example in the community. Regent University, follow your path. Hey, we're thrilled what's happening at Regent University. By the way, they've changed the enrollment times. Every eight weeks, there's a new cohort coming on board. And Regent has business, communications and the arts, divinity and education, psychology and counseling, and uh, government law and leadership. Just to tell you some, these are graduate degrees. They also have an undergraduate program online. You can call in 1-800-210-0060. And uh, it's fabulous education and highly uh, acclaimed uh, prestigious degrees and prestigious awards. And I was told that um, three more of our law graduates have been appointed to the bench. They're judges now. We have hmm. going on 30 judges who are graduates from Regent University, a couple of con congressmen governor, various ones that are graduates. So it's Christian leadership to change the world. It's an exciting place. You can join online, stay at home. You want to complete your degree, there'll be somebody to help you complete it. So again, that number, call in and uh, somebody's there to help you right this very minute. And well, you, so, you know my brother Pete graduated from law yeah, school at yeah. Regent a few years ago. And he, I just saw him over the weekend and he's in the Charlottesville area and he's got more business than he can handle. Wow. But, you know, Pete Griffith in the Charlottesville area, if you need a good lawyer who graduated from a great law school. But he liked, he liked it because of school. <laughs> That was a great commercial. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, it's like, call Pete. He's there waiting for you. He's waiting by the phones. Say, say Wendy sent me. All right, let's take some questions. Oh, man, sorry. All right, we got some doozies today. Teresa writes, hi, Pat. How do I stay faithful in God when the devil works so well in my family? I try and try my hardest to ignore them as well as pray for them, but they always do something to strike an evil nerve inside of me. I'm trying to turn my life around, but it seems like every time I feel like I'm, I'm a step ahead, the devil knocks me back. Uh, I pray daily and try to have all the faith in the world to ignore the devil, but it seems like the devil has more of a hold on me than I could ever imagine. Why doesn't God push the devil away? Look, uh, you push him away. What does the Bible say? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. It says the devil's like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he can devour. So you're saying to him, I acknowledge you. I acknowledge your, your superiority over me and I'm going to do your bidding. Well, I mean, he'll buy that in a heartbeat. But if you say to him, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and the forces of evil, leave me alone, and he will, in the name of Jesus. So 
That's how you do it. What else? All right. James writes, and I recently heard on Bill Moyer's PBS show that some Christians and Republicans believe that the earth is God's creation and therefore there is nothing that people can do to contribute to climate change. This seems to me to be a very dangerous and unchristian position and should be contradicted. What's your position on the human contribution to global warming and the Christian's role? Bill Moyer is, is a former Baptist preacher. He worked uh, uh, with a Democrat administration, and uh, some of the stuff that goes on, he really seems to have a pick on evangelical Christians. He seems to hate capitalists. He hates people involved in the energy business. He, he's, he's after a whole lot of them, and, and he's very persuasive. Uh, I didn't see his show so I, on this particular issue, so I don't know what in the world they're talking about. But to say that we can't affect the, 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 the globe, the, that's not true. Of course we can. I think this climate thing that's come out very frankly is a, is a big scam. I, I think it is an attempt by uh, uh, these, um, well, it's socialist tending people, or whether they call them progressives or whatever, they want to take over uh, the globe. They want to run things. and. If they can limit carbon, if they can limit oil and gas, and they can cut back, they will limit industry, and ultimately they will reduce the population on Earth because a lot of people will die because there isn't enough money to pay uh, for them. So that's what's going to happen. And I had one of them some years ago say, well, really the ideal uh, number on Earth is, is a billion people. And I said, well, what if they, well, we've got you know seven plus billion, well, they just have to die. I mean, th th this is horrible, but this, this climate thing changed. Antarctic ice is growing. It isn't shrinking. And we're in for a cold spell in, on Earth, not a warming spell, because it's affected by sunspots and the course of the Earth and so forth. But yes, we can affect it. We, we are stewards. And God gave us this earth to look after, and we need to do it. We don't pollute the earth. We don't send out trash. We don't want to put our sewage, uh, untreated sewage, into the water. We don't want to kill the plants and, and kill the fish. Think what we did to the buffalo. It was horrible. Think of the carrier pigeons and the other species we have exterminated here on earth. We have not been good stewards. And yes, Christians should be stewards of this earth. We're not supposed to rape the world, but look after it. Okay, what's next? Amen. All right, this viewer writes in, when I was 15, I was pregnant, and my family made me get an abortion. I told them I didn't want to get one because it was a sin. One family member told me that I was already going to hell, so it doesn't matter. No, they are not Christians. When I was 20, I was pregnant again and had another abortion. This was all before I was truly saved and started to walk with Christ. Now I'm married with two babies, and I still feel bad for committing murder to my other two. Will I truly be forgiven, or will I have to be held accountable for killing my two babies? I repeat again that I've said many times the words of the Lord, all sins and blasphemies will be forgiven to the sons of men. You ask God for forgiveness. You plead the blood of Jesus. You say, Jesus Christ died for my sins, and he wants your to have a clean conscience that you might serve the living God. So you made some bad mistakes. No, you're not going to hell because you had sex out of marriage. Uh, that just isn't going to happen. Uh, but what will happen is <clears throat> if, if you continue in sin, then, you know, that's too bad. But you say, I want to be forgiven. Go to the Lord, ask for his forgiveness, tell him you want to be born again, give him your heart and your life. And he loves you. And you can have confidence in the fact that his death is sufficient to pay the price for all of your sins, including abortion. Well, we leave you with our power minute from the book of Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, tomorrow we're going to kick off our annual seven days of Blaze celebration. We've got a tremendous celebration tonight, beginning Rosh Hashanah, and then we'll be doing some prayer that you don't want to miss and wonderful stories. See you then. Bye-bye. Tomorrow. My airspeed indicator was reading 110 and it had dropped to 40 in just the snap of a finger. An engine stalls. That's when I really knew we were in trouble. 
at 8,400 feet. I told the girls, I'm sorry, I don't think we're going to make it. We begin our seven days ablaze on a wing and a prayer. God, I am not ready to go yet. And a crash in the canyons. The whole world went kind of black. Tomorrow on the 700 Club. Children, each of them precious, each of them a gift, each of them unique. All of them are a work in progress, a story being written, a sculpture taking form. That's where Superbook comes in by providing a strong spiritual foundation for the children you love. This month, the prodigal son. Father, I want my share of your estate now. No matter what you've done, God will always love you. This other son of yours wasted your money. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, The Prodigal Son, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. We should be glad and celebrate. Your brother was dead, but he is now alive. Get Superbook and watch the miracles happen.